Ralph Elmore, president and founder of the Proud Black Buddhist World Association. We at the Proud Black Buddhist World Association practice the Buddhist teachings as taught by the 13th century Japanese Buddhist sage Nichiren Shonen. It is Nichiren Shonen who teaches us that it is the Lotus Sutra that is the highest of the Buddhist teachings. My lecture today is the birth of the Proud Black Buddhist World Association. You will learn a lot about Buddhism by learning why we started the Proud Black Buddhist World Association. One thing that you should understand about the Buddhist religion is that in the first century AD, a new Buddhism emerged, whereas Buddhism became separated by race, culture, and language. The new Buddhism is characterized by the language of Sanskrit. Now, Sanskrit is a language whereas all of the black culture history has been extricated out of the Buddhist teachings. Now, the new Buddhism that emerged in the first century AD is called Mahayana Buddhism. Whenever you read about Mahayana Buddhism, you can be assured that all black history, culture, and language has been extricated out of the Buddhist religion. You will not know anything about black people or how Buddhism was in Africa because Mahayana Buddhism took all of this out of Buddhism. Mahayana Buddhism is the time when the Buddha was changed from black to white. Now, let me share with you evidence of when the Buddha changed from black to white. During the time of the Kushan dynasty, this is about the first century AD, a white king, his name was Kanishka, a white king by the name of Kanishka had conquered India. And they had this Buddhist who was a Brahmin originally, and he convinced King Kanishka, Kanishka to take up the Buddhist religion. The Brahmin who became a Buddhist name was Ashvagosha. And Ashvagosha convinced King Kanishka to take on the Buddhist religion because Buddhism at the time of the first century had been completely obliterated out of the Buddhist, uh, out of India because the Brahmins had taken over and they had started this Hindu cult and they killed all the Buddhism. Well, it was Ashwagosha who got with King Kanishka and they introduced this new Buddhism called Mahayana Buddhism. Of course, I want you to look at pictures of the Gandhara carvings. See, when King Kanishka took on the Buddhist religion, what he did was he made the images to look more like himself because he was of the Greek ancestry and he made the Buddha and the Bodhisattvas look like Greek people. I want you to take a look at this. Now, in regards to the 13th century Japanese Buddhist sage, Nichiren rejects Mahayana Buddhism. Now, Japan is a Mahayana Buddhist country. Now, in regards to the Buddhist teachings, I joined the Mahayana Buddhist religion by practicing Zen Buddhism in 1970. Now, in 1974, I joined a Buddhist set in America called NSA, which was an acronym for Nichiren Shoshu of America. NSA later became the SGI, and the lay organization started this own I've joined set. NSA, this I have changed there was my views of society. The SGI on one hand, and that was Nichiren Shoshu. Now, through my Buddhist study, I learned the black history of Buddhism and that the ancient India, in ancient India, the people were called Naga. Some of them called the dead and known as Dravidians. 
they're known as Gallops, but originally India was called Eastern Ethiopia. Now, the kingdom where the Buddha was born is called Magadha. Magadha was founded by a black king, and his name was Sisu Naga. After Sisu Naga, we read about Buddhism, about Bimbasara. Bimbasara was a contemporary of the Buddha Shakyamuni. Now, those of you who are learning Buddhism from the Proud Black Buddhist World Association, I would like for you to Google a book. It's a free book that's online. It's called The Journal of the Royal Asiatic Society of Great Britain and Ireland. Please understand that the Buddhist religion has a history of racism and that all of the black history, culture, and language has been extricated from the Buddhist religion. In my personal case, I was a member of the SGI slash NSA Buddhist set, and when I inquired about the black Buddhist history, I went against the SGI leader, Dasaki Kato, who wrote in his book, it's called The Living Buddha. In the book, The Living Buddha, Dasaki Kato writes that the Buddha came from an Indo-Aryan cultural spirit. Now, by my understanding the history and the black Buddhist uh, history, I could no longer stay with the SGI Buddhist set and I could no longer go along with the lie and a misrepresentation of Buddhism. So I left the SGI. I wrote a letter to the SGI in March of 1991 and I could no longer take it because I wanted to see the black Buddhist history to be inclusive of our Buddhist teachings. And of course, I, uh, from 1981 until 1996, for five years, I practiced by myself until, until a friend of mine by the name of Shaka Kalfani, who we're going to talk more about in this lecture. Shaka worked for Northwest Airlines, and he had went on what is called Tozan at the Nichiren Shoshu Temple in Taisekiji, Japan. And Shaka owed me some money, so in order to pay me back, and I will be a friend and by introducing him to Buddhism, Shaka arranged for me to go to Tozon. And when I went to Tozon, I was very skeptical of what was going on because I had realized that these people had taken away all the black history, all the black culture, all the black language from Buddhism. So when I went to Japan, I took a professional video camera and a laptop computer. So instead of going to Japanese, Japan, like everyone else was going on Tozan, I went as a documentary filmmaker. In fact, I recorded more English speaking people at Taisekiji, Japan than anybody in the history of Nichiren Shoshu Buddhism and that I talked to everybody. I had, I actually recorded three high priests. I was given access to the temple of Taisekiji so I was able to study and learn and get a clearer and a more intense and in-depth understanding of Nichiren Shoshu. Now, in 1998, I had the opportunity to, to travel to Accra, Ghana for the opening of the first Nichiren Shoshu Temple in Africa. And I was of the opinion that Nichiren Shoshu was a fair Buddhist set and that we would have a teaching that was inclusive of our black history, culture, and language. And what had happened was the Buddhist in Accra, Ghana, da, S.G. Ali, the Daisaki Keda, had did a coup and that what he wanted to do is that he get you to start the Buddhist practice off, but what he wanted to do was teach you about an Akeda 
consciousness. So he got rid of all the black leaders in America. And in Ghana, there was a man by the name of Joseph Asamani, who was the only black general director in the SGI. And we all knew about Joseph Asamani, but what happened was, Dasaki Keita tried to get rid of him and replace him with, a, with the Japanese, and the people in Ghana fought. And what happened was, for five years, no one knew what happened to Joseph Asamani because the people in Ghana had broken off. And the priesthood found out about the people in Ghana, they had broken away from from Dasaki Keita, they had broken away from the SGI, and they were practicing independently. Well, the priesthood came in, they gave them money, and they took that money and built the largest temple outside of Japan in the world. They built the largest Nichiren Shoshin temple. So, in 1998, I had the opportunity to go to Ghana for the first Nichiren Shoshin temple opening. Now, not only did I have the opportunity to go to Ghana, I was selected as the official videographer. So, Nichiren Shoshu gave me total and unabated access to filming and talking and learning. So, I got a knowledge and I got a background that was unprecedented because I was the official videographer for the first opening of the first Nichiren Shoshu Temple in Africa. Now, what happened was, the SGI had this big fight and they were going back and forth and I wrote the members in America to tell them what Daisaki Keita had done to the African people. And I documented and I recorded. Now, what happened was, the people or the members in America, especially my father, his name, my Buddhist father, his name was Mr. Joseph Thomas. I sent Mr. Thomas a video of what was going on in Africa, and I wanted him to see, and I sent videos to all the members in Memphis to show them what Daisaki Keita had done and the racism that he was doing. And of course, Mr. Thomas sent me the video back. He wouldn't accept it. And a lot of the members were closed-minded. They did not want to know what Dasal Kikeda did. So, there was this white guy. His name was Craig Bratcher, who practiced in Chicago. And Craig was an engineer, and he could read DOS, and he understood DOS. And this is like back in 1998, he was an internet guy who understood how the internet worked, and things were different. So. I sent Craig Bratcher this video and told him what I was trying to do and he helped me to develop a website and I felt I developed a website called The Proud Black Buddhist and I had this website that I started in 1998 and what happened was because I had a website and because I had a Proud Black Buddhist website I could now tell a black side of Buddhism and through my study of understanding the black history and the black culture, I was able to write more about black Buddhist history than any person in the world. In fact, if you Google the name Black Buddhist, it is Anthony Elmore who comes up the first person on the Google search engine because we were out there years ago doing all the Buddhist study and, and history. Now what happened was by my going out and my telling the story and my having a Black Buddhist website, I had no idea that Japanese did not like a black man who was independent and free. The thing that they would ask me is that, did you get permission from the priests to have this website to tell these stories because they wanted you to be controlled? Well, the priest at Nichiren Choshu did not say anything to me about my website, 
But what they did was they quietly got behind my back and they told the members in Memphis, Tennessee, don't associate with Anthony Elmore. So what has happened was, from 1998 and the time I did this website, and we go into the new millennium and there I am at Japan and everybody is like mad at me. They ain't got this guy by the name of Tony. Tony was a New York Nitrin Show Shoe member and Tony was upset. In fact, I showed Tony on the website and Tony was saying anything that was not of the priest was not real. So you had this culture in Buddhism Whereas the African Americans in Nitrin Joshu did not like me because I had a website, I was not sanctioned by the priests, and for years I could write and I can tell the story. But what happened was, in fact, in 2003, I was at Taisekiji, Japan, and Tony got together with this priest from San Francisco. His name was Reverend Takahashi. And Reverend Takahashi and Tony came up to me at the, at the temple at Tasekiji. And Reverend Takahashi says, I want to know about this website and who gave you permission to have a website. I looked at that little sucker and I told him, I said, wait a minute. I am an American. I'm no Japanese. I practice religion because we have freedom of religion. And I don't need no permission to have a website. I'm an American. And I have religious freedom and you better get out my face because I know Japanese culture and history. In fact, you got no business talking to me because you're not my priest. But since you bring the subject up about my website, I want to go to the Nitrin Shoshu office. Since we're at the head temple, Let's go to the overseas bureau and let's discuss some of this racism and let's discuss the idea of making black history and culture inclusive of our Buddhist teachings. That little sucker looked at me and he dropped his head. I said, I dare you. I said, let's go. I said, Reverend Obiashi, he's the overseas bureau chief. Let's go talk. This guy was so cowardice. But what they did was, those priests put out an unwritten story that no one was to associate with me. So, we come to the time that the priests isolated me in Nichiren Shoshu Buddhism. There I was practicing, dedicated, had my website, I'm um, challenging SGI members for racism and and but what happened was the S the Nitrin Shoshu, they did what the SGI couldn't do. They come in under the auspices of a religious organization and they got rid of Mr. Joseph Asamani because they were priests and they got rid of him and nobody would challenge these Nitrin Shoshu priests. Now, in 2006, I married an Ethiopian woman and I brought her to the temple in Ghana and when I took her to America and we would go to Buddhist meetings and for from 2006 up until for four or five years the meetings were horrible because I was trying to get the members to make our black culture and our history inclusive of Buddhism and the members were told by the priests don't associate with me. So every idea that I had, they had, they were working behind the scenes to destroy all the things that I was doing. And it was a horrible situation. The meetings were horrible. And it was not until about 2012 when Nitrin Shoshu Priest, Reverend Shinji Iwaki, came to my home. And he, said, he stood right here in front of this altar and he says, let's leave culture out of Buddhism, no more culture. 
Man, I looked at that little sucker. I said, wait a minute. Here you are, want me to have Japanese culture, Japanese history, Japanese language, but yet you don't want me to make black culture inclusive of our Buddhist practice. At that time, in 2012, I made a decision that I would leave the Nichiren Show Shu religion. Now, at the time, my friend Shaka Kalafani had joined Nichiren Shu. So, I contacted Shaka, I said, I'd like to know more about Nichiren Shu. And I had people who the Nichiren Shoshu had turned down, who discriminated against because they didn't want me to be successful. So I went to meetings at Chakra House, and you see me at the Buddhist meetings at Chakra House. And I told Shaka, I said, Shaka, let's get this thing going, and we're going to call this thing the Proud Memphis Proud Black Buddhist. And Shaka had agreed to it. Now, but what happened was, Shaka is a member of the Nitrin Shu Temple in Houston, Texas. And Shaka, the woman who is the head priest, was the first African American Nitrin Shu, Nitrin priest in the world. And she, her name was Mukai Shonen. And Mukai Shonen got with Shaka and says, Man, you guys, we can't be having no religion, talking about no proud black. A Memphis proud black Buddhist, we cannot do this. See, what I didn't realize was Nichiren Shu, like Nichiren Choshu and like the SGI, they are Mahayana Buddhists and they practice the Sanskrit teachings that educate all black history, culture, and language from Buddhism. So on November of 19 of 2013, I wrote a letter to the Nitrin Shoshu heads and I asked them what was their policy regarding African Americans. And when I wrote that letter to the Nitrin Shoshu heads, Shaka got mad and he wrote me a nasty letter. Shaka called me a terrorist and he called me a terrorist and he said I was no longer welcome at his house anymore. And this Muke Shonen, who was his priest, Shaka and I were the best friends. The man was like a brother to me. Shaka was an independent trucker. And when he when I borrowed money on my house, I borrowed a hundred thousand dollars on my house. I told Shaka, I said, man, I got money and you a trucker. I loaned that man $10,000 to, to buy his own tractor trailer truck so he could be an independent business guy. He was a guy who lived in my house, a man who I loved so much as a brother. We traveled all over the world together. But Shaka followed this half Japanese woman by the name of Muke Shonen. And Muke Shonen had, and the way that they teach Nichiren Shu Buddhism, Shaka said I was no longer welcome at his house. And there I was, ladies and gentlemen. And this is November 2013. And I had to make a big decision. Now, this decision that I made comes in line with the topic of my Buddhist lecture today. Because in 2013, when my friend and my brother, who I love so much, we had traveled the world, we did kickboxing together. When he turned his back and said, I was no longer welcome at his house anymore, the members of Nichiren Shoshu Buddhism had all turned their back on me because the Nitrin Shoshu priest told them, do not associate with me. There I was, Nitrin Shoshu, Nitrin Shu, and the SGI. I really did not have a Buddhist friend in the world. 
I was trying to get the priest to honor Dr. Martin Luther King. Let's make our Buddhist practice inclusive of our black history, our culture, and our language. But what happened was everybody associated with the Japanese and they turned their backs on me. Now, there I was, a Buddhist. I had been a Buddhist for 43 years and no Buddhist friends. My wife, who I had brought into Buddhism, she saw the horrors of associating with the Japanese sects in that they take black people and they make them attenuate the culture, the history, and the language. And these people become robots and they are no longer active in their community, but they become a part of Japanese cultural imperialism. What had happened, ladies and gentlemen, that I had nowhere to go, but Shaka had wrote this letter to me, and I was trying to help this woman in Zambia who wanted to get a gohanzan, who wanted to learn, and Shaka said, you can help this woman with your almighty website. And what happened was, even though I had nobody, the one thing that I had, what had happened, ladies and gentlemen, is that in 1998, when I started the Proud Black Buddhist website, a new culture, a new entity had emerged, a new what we call an insentient being called the internet had emerged. And what happened was I became the number one Buddhist, black Buddhist in the world. In all of our world, ladies and gentlemen, there is not one independent black Buddhist set in the world. And so the only person that really who was a Buddhist, who was independent, was Anthony Elmore. So in January of 2014, because I had what was called the Proud Black Buddhist website, I had what is called an agorism. That was, now that we had computers, and everybody's computer is a cell phone, and when you Google Proud Black Buddhist, there's Anthony Elmore the number one Buddhist in the world. In that I was given the task and the honor of being able to teach people Buddhism. And God was right there in that I was given the Proud Black Buddhist website. So in January of 2014, I launched an organization called Proud Black Buddhist World Association. I not only stood alone, I learned how to become a black Buddhist in America. I became the most knowledgeable Buddhist in the world in regards to black history, language, and culture. I posted more black Buddhist videos, history, and culture than anyone in the world. We have nearly 600 videos on YouTube. Our website at the time of this lecture is 22 years old. We literally created a black Buddhist set and we have now launched our new proud black Buddhist website. We have the most comprehensive black Buddhist website in the world. We spent 22 years to develop our black Buddhist set and now you can help. Please donate to help us bring our proud black Buddhist world association to the 21st century. You can donate more than just money. You can donate your time, your energy, your creativity to help making our organization viable. You, we're asking everyone to join the organization. Please understand that when we say black, we mean culture, not race. We do not discriminate. Everyone is welcome. We are a cultural organization, not a racial organization. Please join and come with us 
and the Proud Black Buddhist World Association. Thank you very much.